And as uh, Brent prayed already for those uh, that are suffering because of Hurricane Helene, we want to lift them up in prayer as well. Um, and uh, I was prompted this morning to, um, to remind you that uh, there are ways that we can give towards the, the efforts and the relief efforts that are happening for the Missouri Baptist Disaster Relief or through the Southern Baptist SEND Network that have been sending resources and teams down there. Um, and so if you'd like to contribute to that, I'll be sending out more information and putting it in your bulletin for next Sunday. Um, but really the best way uh, that we can do is send it along with those that we know are going with the gospel message. And so I'll be able to get that to you here soon. And so um, uh, some of my prayer requests this morning uh, as we pray are going to be for some of our missionaries and some of the requests that our missionaries have sent us. And so I wanna, let's pray together and pray for the gospel to go out. Heavenly Father, we as a church come to you um, as our Father, um, as our Lord, as our Savior, and we ask for you to answer our prayers in accordance with your will. We pray that your kingdom advances. We pray that your will is done in our lives and in the lives of all on this earth. We pray that you would be honored as God in our midst and around the world. So, Father, we ask for you to save those that our missionaries in India are uh, seeking to share the gospel with through their various efforts. Um, they sent uh, about a man named Abdul um, that needs your help, that needs the confidence in the scriptures. So we pray that you would uplift him in his faith. We pray that you would care for him in an incredible way in the coming weeks. Father, we pray for the Moyer family uh, as they welcomed uh, a son this week. Pray for Sierra and pray for the whole family as they seek to just be amazed at the blessing that you give them and persevere through the trial of having a little, little one in the house. And uh, Father, we just ask for you to be with them as they uh, enjoy your blessings. Father, we pray for the Tuckers, for, for Janice as she's recovering from surgery from this past week. We thank you that it's successful. We thank you that her recovery is well on its way. And we pray that she would be encouraged each and every day, trusting in you, relying on you. Father, we pray for uh, the churches and the seminary in the Philippines with the Master's Academy International. We pray that you would uh, bring great fruitfulness to their study of the word and the training of pastors to preach the word of God and preach only the word of God. God, we pray for our partner churches here in our community, those that are preaching the gospel this morning, um, those that are proclaiming uh, the good news of salvation. Uh, we pray for First Baptist Church. We pray for New Hope. We pray for Calvary. We pray for many others, Father, um, because we know that our community needs the gospel desperately. We need every church in our community to proclaim the truth and to proclaim it without fear, proclaim it with boldness. Father, we pray for the coming election. We know that there is um, many things we could worry about, but Father, instead of worrying, Father, we will bring them to you. We ask that you would uh, bring the end of abortion in our country. We know that it's evil of the murder of children is something that you cannot abide. And so, Father, we pray for its end, and we pray for the boldness and the, to proclaim the truth that murder should have nothing to do with our Constitution, nothing to do with our state. And so, Father, may we proclaim the truth, and may you, you Father, protect children and women. God, we ask for our time in your word this morning to be blessed. We pray that we would receive from your word the food that we need, the food for our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, church family, would you open to Matthew chapter 6. We are closing out Matthew 6, and Matthew 7 is going to go really quick. And so this morning is really the, the second part of what Jesus began teaching us last week. Because last week we talked about trusting treasure and the foolishness that that is. And ultimately today we're going to talk about trusting tomorrow as we are often a people that is prone to worry. And so I want you to think about last week when Jesus was instructing his disciples to not lay up their treasures on earth where they can be destroyed, where they are temporary, but instead to lay up their treasures in heaven. 
And I want you to think about if Jesus' disciples then and now would do exactly that. If we would invest all of what we have in the seeing of the kingdom to advance, invest in a way in which ultimately our treasure is not our own, it's God's, it's laying up for us in the future. And therefore, what would happen if we invest properly is that there would be a way in which we don't have that money available for us. So the connection between last week and this week, because what we're going to see at the beginning of verse 25 is a therefore, is because we will not serve money, we will not keep our money here on this earth, we will invest all of what we have in seeing the kingdom advance, we will invest it in the treasures that are in heaven. There's a way in which we need daily reliance upon God, and therefore we have to understand and we ask the question rightly, how will I provide for my daily needs if I'm investing in something that's beyond this life? Wouldn't that just lead us to worry or be anxious about what we need for food or water or clothing or shelter? If we're investing for the future and we have less for today, wouldn't that lead us to worry? And this is exactly what Jesus wants to address in his disciples. If we will invest for his kingdom priorities, we will ultimately find that God will provide for us and he will provide for us daily. So let's read, uh, starting with just verse 25, because let's read how Jesus follows up this command to lay up treasures in heaven. And he says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Now, we'll see this command. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. We'll see that command, and that's what it is, a command, three times throughout this passage. You can skip forward to verse 31 or verse 34 to see it repeated. Because what ultimately Jesus is going to do is go through cycles of explaining, because we are faithful to God, investing where we need to invest, therefore, as we're prone to anxiety, we're prone to worry, God gives us reason after reason, example after example, hope after hope, not to be anxious. And so I want to define anxiety for a second, because in the original Greek uh, that is written here from Matthew, the word for anxiety is actually that of concern. Now, throughout the Bible, the word concern in the Greek is used in both positive and negative ways. Obviously, uh, here, Jesus is using it in a negative. He's telling us, do not be anxious. Do not have concern for things of this life. And we'll talk about a good concern here in a moment, but ultimately, the anxiety that we are commanded not to indulge can be really defined succinctly. Anxiety is a fear in search of a cause. Anxiety is fear in search of a cause. Now, if you wanted a more expanded definition, maybe a counselor's definition, if you yourself suffer or struggle with anxiety, you could define anxiety this way. Anxiety is a state of intense apprehension, uncertainty, or fear resulting from an anticipation, something that's going to happen or might happen, of a threatening event or situation, often to a degree that normal physical and psychological functioning is disrupted. Now, we hear that definition, and we just have to think, okay, apprehension, uncertainty, and fear. All of us have experienced that. All of us, at some level, have an anxiety about what might happen, what might come. And the reason is because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And so this particular command that Jesus gives us, do not be anxious, is do not be anxious over what you need. Because we're often worried about the things that we think we need, but Jesus is always is just getting down to the root of it. If you will invest where you need to invest, God will provide for what you need. Because Jesus hints at what he's going to close with. What we need for our life, what we need for our body, is much deeper than food. It's much deeper than water. It's much deeper than clothing. 
We may be worried about the physical, but what will free us from anxiety is a heavenly Father who gives us beyond we might expect in spiritual blessings. And then he provides physically. So he commands us to begin with not to be anxious. And anything that God commands us not to do is sin if we do it. And so anxiety is sinful because it ignores God. That's ultimately what it gets to. Anxiety is sinful because it ignores God and it magnifies ourselves. It makes us think that our worry, our struggle, our focus on it is going to be the solution. And what we're going to find, just as we found back in verse 24, that we cannot serve both our fear and God. We cannot serve God if we are too fearful that he will not provide for us. Because worry is functionally a distrust of God. And he reveals that in the two examples that he gives beyond this. So let's continue reading verses 26 through 30. Because, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. He then says, look at the birds of the air. They neither soar nor sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Now, I want you to see the perfect, helpful logic that Jesus lays out here. And the first is this example of the birds. He goes from the birds, which are many, which are ultimately of very little value, and he argues that because they are of little value, how much more will God take care of those that he sees and has made with incredible value? He argues from the lesser to the greater. And so the question here is that of value. Are you not of more value than they? But it's also a question of futility, verse 27. How, if the birds don't gather and sow, if they're not storing up in the barns, if they're not working their way trying to just provide for tomorrow, if your anxiety about those things, it can't add to the day. It can't make you more productive. It can't ultimately provide for you. And so he's saying anxiety itself is a futile practice. And so when we think that birds don't farm and they don't gather, we also have to recognize that birds work hard. You've never seen a bird really sit still, right? My, uh, my wife is not in here this morning. She's back in the nursery, so I can tell on her a little bit. She does not like birds. Um, we kind of stay away from birds. Um, if there's a bird out on the patio for, uh, at the restaurant, uh, it's not a good thing. So we don't, we don't do that. So, but the reality is that you see a bird, and Lexi can't trust it because she can't trust that it's just going to stay where it's at. It might get closer. Um, and so we know that birds work hard to provide for what they need. They work hard because they're constantly putting together nests, providing for their young, and finding the food they need for that day. But Jesus doesn't attribute their lack of anxiety to their work ethic. He links their lack of anxiety to God's provision. They do not worry because God provides and always will. See, we, we must be, by Jesus' example, birds that recognize we cannot add to our life by our worry. Ultimately, we can have no worry because we trust that we will be provided for. So for every minute that we worry, we are not enjoying the life God gave us. We are robbed of many of God's good gifts because we've spent it hour by hour minute by minute, moment by moment, worrying about something that's outside of our control and that God has promised is in his control. So let's look at the second example. Let's look at the lilies, starting in verse 28. Because why are you anxious about clothing? And this is ultimately, as Jesus was talking about earlier, um, talking about the cloak, 
the, the reality is, is that to worry about your clothing is to worry about your protection. It's to worry about your shelter. So you could say the same thing applies not just to us that have more clothes than we could possibly wear out, but about how will God protect me for today and tomorrow? How will he provide shelter for me? And the question, again, is that of value. Consider the lilies of field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory, the greatest, most rich, most provided for king of all of Israel's history, was not so arrayed like one of these. So the argument now, instead of lesser to greater, like the birds, is from the greater to the lesser, from Solomon and his greatness and how beautiful flowers are. How could we expect to have really, uh, we see God's incredible provision and say, all we need is the simple provision of clothing, the simple provision of protection. Because he talks about how the grass is so uh, so temporary. We read in Isaiah chapter 40 that the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God endures forever. The great testimony of the scriptures is how grass is to be burned. It is to be gone tomorrow. And I, I see this in my family when my kids go out in the summer and pick flowers. The previous owner of our home planted a ton of flowers all around our backyard. And so there's flowers that pop up all throughout the summer and our kids will go and pick them and then bring them inside. But they'll pick just the top part. You can't even like put it in water, right? You just give the flower. And I know that that flower is going to die a lot faster now that it's picked than if it had just stayed planted and rooted. But the reality is, is that no matter if they pick them or not, those flowers are going away. And then we see how God talks about the lilies that don't work either, but ultimately they are clothed. And what this is rooted in is that just as the birds are, we're, rec we're remembering in verse 26, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then we recognize in verse 30 that God so clothes the field. We recognize that we have a Father. We should let that sink in when we worry, when we're prone to anxiety. We have a Father. We have a Father that provides. And to ignore this, and indulge anxiety is rooted in ultimately a lack of trust in our Father. And this is why Jesus ends this section talking about our lack of faith. We have a weaker faith than birds, a weaker faith than flowers. So this phrase, O you of little faith, is not saying, O you with no faith. Because remember, this sermon is written to, is spoken to, is preached to Jesus' disciples. And so we should not think that he's belittling uh, their faith to be non-existent, as if they don't trust him at all. But he's saying that our anxiety is a proof of a little faith, a faith ultimately that we know is sufficient, a faith like a mustard seed. And we stand as believers in Jesus Christ in a long tradition of little faiths, those that have shown at times to have little faith. You can turn farther along in Matthew to Matthew chapter 8, verses 26, when the disciples are in a boat with Jesus and Jesus takes a, a nap and his disciples see the storm coming up all around them and Jesus rebukes them of their you of little faith. His disciples, his closest friends, those that trusted him the most, says you of little faith. Or continue on further in Matthew, Matthew 14, verse 31, when Peter comes walks out of the boat on the water to Jesus, but then as his worry sinks in, he starts sinking. And I want, to, I want you to remember that story because we're going to talk about it again in a moment when we turn to 1 Peter 5, when Peter talks about his worry and how we are not to worry then as well. But then you keep going in Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 8. Jesus again calls his disciples with little faith because they do not grasp the spiritual truth that's right there in front of them. And so what I want you to understand is that disciples may have anxiety. We may doubt. We may be anxious. But what we have to settle on is that our anxiety is not something that we just suffer with and endure and say, oh, it's no big deal. We don't just massage it and deal with it. We ultimately say, 
we need to put it aside. It's not good. We shouldn't settle for anxiety because we have a father. We're not orphans. We're not servants without a master. That's an impossible contradiction. And this is what leads Jesus to ultimately go to the ultimate contrast. And so in verses 31 through 32, we see this contrast. Jesus says again, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what, that you need them all. So there's that repetition again. Do not be anxious. And as he gives that instruction, he then contrasts his disciples who were there hearing this sermon with the Gentiles. Again, the Gentiles is the explanation of those that are not Jews. So the Jews were God's people, his covenant people that were given the Messiah that is Jesus. So Jesus, talking to his Jewish disciples, says that even the Gentiles, even the unbelievers, even the pagans worry about these things. And the pagans worshiped gods and sacrificed to them, as we talked about in previous weeks, hoping that the gods just might provide, that they might answer their prayers. If they offer just the right prayers or just the right sacrifices, then their capricious Greek gods might answer. But those gods, those Gentiles, need to be contrasted with the Jews, the people of God, the believers today, the Christian, who instead of a God that we that might answer our prayer, that might provide. Instead, we have a heavenly Father who will provide. Because Jesus says, your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. And so we can go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, where we see right before the Lord's prayer, the disciples' prayer, do not be like them, the Gentiles, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Our Father knows. But our Father also gave us the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not one that is prone to fear. What does Romans 8, 15 say? He did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of confidence in the Father. And lastly, we're going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. And I said we were going to remember Peter and his worry and his anxiety of what might happen as he stepped out onto the waves. So 1 Peter is near the end of our Bibles. If you get to Hebrews and then James and then 1 Peter is right there. And we're going to 1 Peter chapter 5. And this, this summer, Kayvon preached a, a message on this. And so you can find it on our website if you'd like to have some more teaching on this particular uh, passage. But first Peter, fast, first Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Peter, the worrier, says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. God cares for you. As Peter walked out onto the waves, his worry was that, Jesus, who was sustaining his footsteps on top of the waves, didn't care if he sank or not. Peter had a great long line of worry and trying to take things into his own hands. He was the one that when Jesus was arrested, Peter got out his knife, thinking that his, somehow his knife was going to stop the crucifixion of his Lord, cutting off Malchus's ear, trying, striving, worrying that something he could do could fix it. And so we have to get back to the reason that worry is sinful in the first place is because we pridefully forget that we are nothing. We should humble ourselves before the mighty, powerful, providing hand of God because if we worry, as we worry, we assume that God is not sovereign that he is not good, and ultimately we're assuming that he's not our father. Imagine, imagine telling your earthly father that he is not your father. Can you imagine the wounds that that would give him? Or imagine your child, if you are a father, 
telling you that you're no longer his father. You no longer can count on him. You no longer expect him to be there for you. As we worry, we tell our heavenly father that we don't believe he will provide, that we don't believe his word, that we don't believe his promises. And so I want you to think back to the examples in Matthew 6, just before this, verses 26 through 30. All we have to do to see God's provision is look around us. All we have to do is see the simplicity of the bird that does not worry. The simplicity of the flower clothed in all its grandeur. Because when we think about God, we think about the God who runs the universe down to the details, down to the birds, down to the petals, down to the worm. And who do we think we are that we as God's children would not be provided for by our Father? So if we're not to worry, if that's the expectation for believers is not to worry, what are we supposed to do? Because if, if you're a worry wart here in this morning and you spend a lot of time worrying, that is what you're doing. You're expecting that your worry would somehow get you out of it. So are we supposed to just twiddle our little thumbs, waiting on God's provision? I don't think that's, that's what Jesus says here. So let's continue to read verse 33. So what are we to do if we are not to worry? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What are we to do? Seek. Seek the kingdom of God. This word for seek talks about being consumed without, with searching out to the very small thing, what we need, what we're looking for. And so you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 13 because Jesus gives instructions to his disciples about the, the parables about the kingdom. What is the kingdom like? All of Matthew 13 describes the kingdom of God and so he gives this parable about the pearl of great value in verses 45 and 46. So Matthew 13, verses 45 and 46. What are we to be doing when we seek first the kingdom of God? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Imagine all the pearls that this pearl merchant had found before. How much value that he would have invested at this point in his collection. How many that he's bought and sold. How much that he had stored up. And when he finds the pearl of great price, when he finds and seeks out the kingdom of God and finds it and has it in his grasp, he sells everything else for it. There is an abandon to the seeking of the kingdom of God. Again, we go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. Do not, or sorry, verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's seeking the kingdom, investing where it matters most. Or you can think about Colossians 3.1, when Paul tells the Colossians to set their mind on things above. Or Paul's instruction to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18, look for the things that are unseen, not the things that are seen. So what does Jesus give us to do? If we're not to worry, if we're not to indulge sinful anxiety, what are we to do? What if we, how do we get our sinful anxiety to decrease? It's that we are consumed with seeking after the faithful kingdom pursuit that is the answer to our anxiety. To be so focused on kingdom priorities, on the advance of the gospel, on the planting of churches, on the support and sending of missionaries, on the growth of our children in the truth, on the holiness of the church, on the care for the widow and the orphan, all for God's glory. That's what consumes us, not the worry about tomorrow. So we get busy with, fathers, with our father's business. 
That's what gives us ultimately a good anxiety, a good concern that God's will would we be done. That's what may keep us up at night, no longer about what God may not provide, but ultimately our confidence that ultimately, how can I be faithful tomorrow? Father, how will I be consumed with the kingdom tomorrow? Because if you get consumed with concern like Jesus, because when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane preparing for the cross, his anxiety and concern for God's glory made him sweat blood. He had the right concern, the right anxiety, knowing the pain and the suffering that was coming for him, but ultimately his, he set his heart, he set his mind on God's will being done. And so if we finally have concern for the right things, it will push out any worry or anxiety about the things of this life. The things of this life can consume us and paralyze us, but concern for things of God will amplify and push us forward to be faithful. And therefore, we won't have time to worry about the things here on this earth. But that's not all that Jesus gives us. He says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is the theme of the Sermon on the Mount. You can go back to chapter 5, verse 6, that we would desire and hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then you can go to verse 10, and you can see, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Then you can see it in verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Or you can see it in verse 48. You therefore must be perfect, righteously perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or the very next verse, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. And here we get one of the pinnacles of the sermon. To seek first the kingdom of God the activity of God, the advance of the gospel, and his righteousness that is now our greatest concern. I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans, the first book of, or first letter in the New Testament canon. Romans 14, Verses 17 through 19. Because here we get the kingdom of God as Paul is discussing whether you should eat food sacrificed to idols or not, whether it be a stumbling block to those around you. He gives this ultimately pinnacle because he says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbringing. To pursue and seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness is simply to serve Christ. To pursue peace in the church. To build up one another as we disciple the next generation. And what does Jesus say if we will do these things? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, every bit of food or clothing or water or provision that is necessary, all these things will be added to you. And how do we know this is true? Because he fulfilled the most important promise. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? So Jesus concludes in verse 34, the last repetition, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so without everything that has come before, without an expectation that God provides for the birds, he provides for the lilies, without the expectation that even the Gentiles, unbelievers, worry about these things, but yet we have a father We're not unbelievers, we're believers. 
And then if we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be added to us. If we put all that aside and just think about what we would worry without it, it would be right to worry. If we didn't have any promise that God would provide for us, if we didn't have any expectation that tomorrow would be taken care of, then worry would be the correct human response. Because evil days are coming. Hurricanes can wipe out anything. Wars in Iran and Israel can spread. The reality is the uncertainty of this life, we recognize that evil is present. And the scriptures don't deny that. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, the book of wisdom from the preacher says, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. It's this recognition that we can have good days and we should revel in them and enjoy them because evil days do come. And so there are going to be many tomorrows that we do not enjoy. We don't have to deny that. What we do have to deny is our human inclination to be anxious about them. Because think back to verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And now here in verse 34, we essentially don't have enough hours in our day-to-day to worry about tomorrow. Realize that this is the compounding issue of worry. If you take today's worries and then you add tomorrow's on top of them, what are you doing? You're doubling up the worst two-for-one special that's ever existed. George MacDonald was a 19th century Scottish pastor who put it this way, no man ever sank under the burden of the day. It is when tomorrow's burden is added to the burden of today that the weight is more than a man can bear. So if you this morning are a worry wart or an anxious personality, this is for you. Notice that Jesus doesn't say here that worry about today is the issue. He's not saying that the stress you're going under, the difficult circumstances that you're facing, the crying and the screaming of your children, I have to say that for my wife, the stress you're under today is not to be ignored. You do have difficult days. Jesus isn't trying to get you to live in denial as if there aren't hard things. We aren't commanded to ignorantly or passively float through life, but we are to act and act today in trust in God that he will, as we seek his kingdom first, provide for us that day. And not to be thinking about tomorrow. An example from nature might clarify this. If you think about a tree, a tree ultimately has no power to maintain itself. Its roots are, as it were, kind of an empty hand stretched out into the soil, into the environment. It's dependent on the sun to rise that day, the air to provide the carbon dioxide it needs, the clouds to bring the rain, and the soil itself to nourish itself. It doesn't even have the strength to absorb the nutrients it requires. The sun has to bring it to it. But does this mean that the tree is inactive? Not at all. A tree's roots are in a single day bringing up so much water, raising it up from the ground. It's completely repetitive, but its roots and its leaves are working all the time to transform energy. For example, it's been estimated that the amount of work done by a large tree in a single day to raise water and minerals from the soil to its leaves is equal to the amount of a man that carries 300 buckets full of water, two at a time, up a 10-foot flight of stairs. If you can't imagine that, that's a lot of hard work. Not one that you could undertake in a day. The leaves themselves are virtual factories transforming the sunlight into usable energy. Tremendously active. And so, friends, the reality is, is that we may not be the one that provides our nutrients or the one that shines the sun, but yet we grow because we trust that God will provide all those things. We actively work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We actively seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, wanting holiness to be who we are. 
Because we know as we do those things, not in worry, but in trust, God will provide all that we need. And so, in conclusion, if you've been waiting for me to say that, in conclusion, the Sermon on the Mount and this sermon today is for Christians. If you have yet to submit your life to Christ and the mission of His kingdom in the local church, the cure of anxiety is not available to you. Without Christ, anxiety is a natural response. So for you, anxiety is expected and should be expected because the fears of this cursed world are likely to come true in some way. And so if you're waiting this morning, if you're waiting for the one day it's going to feel right to come forward in baptism, your anxiety each and every day should remind you there's no time to wait. If you're waiting to make the commitment to finally follow Christ, to give your life to Him and give everything you are to seek His kingdom, let your worry be the reason that you say, I can't handle this. I need Christ. Because you're denying the promises that Jesus gives to His people here in this passage. And so come to Christ. The offer is for today. And then you don't have to worry about tomorrow. But I want you to think, just practically as Christians, what are we to do when we worry? And the first thing, and I'm going to give you some examples of this, is that you need to train your trust reflexes. Train your trust in God. We all have reflexes that are kind of instinctual. They're automatic in some way that God made us to have in order to respond quickly, in order to survive in some cases. So in order to survive anxiety, we need to train our instincts of trust for how the Lord will provide instead of feeding our anxiety. We need to have that moment and develop as soon as worry crops up, as soon as anxiety for tomorrow, as soon as worry about the provision that we need comes up, immediately turn it in prayer. Don't wait immediately. Let reflex be the response of trust in Christ. And then what do we think about the content of those prayers? If you're anxious, we want to pray first, what? For God's kingdom. Get our focus off of ourselves. You can and should pray for your anxiety to be diminished. You can and should pray for peace. You should pray for God's provision. The Lord's Prayer includes it. Give us this day our daily bread. But again, first pray to our Father, because we are His child, for His kingdom to come and His will to be done and for His righteousness to transform us because we are a Christian. And so we, tr we develop our trust reflexes in our prayers, but we also develop our trust reflexes in just how we live every day. Live, truly live, because God provides we do not live in the future through anxiety. Again, the, the, the easy reminders are in birds and, leave, and trees and flowers. So enjoy them. Go outside. See that God provides for everything. Enjoy every day. Put your arms around your wife or your husband. Take your walks and your time with your children at the park. Enjoy the life that God has given you, and in doing so, you're putting off worry because you can just enjoy the things that he's given. If you thought this sermon was just going to beat you into the ground for being anxious, I hope that's not what you're hearing. I hope that you're hearing that there's so much more to the anxious life that you may be stuck in. Because just like the gospel, there's an invitation out of foolish unbelief, and into the true blessings of God that we can enjoy each and every day in just the simple things. And lastly, if you're going to train your trust reflexes, you train in your prayers, you train in just your everyday living your life. And the third thing is just don't assume the worst. Because if you assume the worst about your situation, about the future, by projecting in the future, as I said already, you're thinking about a future where God doesn't exist. 
You're thinking about a future that God is not good and that God is not sovereign and God is not your father. Don't assume what you know is not true. That is unbelief. And so I want you to just think about this as we close. You have been given every reason, every example, every bit of command and direction by God not to worry. So the question before you is, what will you seek first? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that there is a cure for our anxiety, that we trust you. We trust you for tomorrow, but most importantly, Father, we don't think about tomorrow. We trust you for today. So I pray for the person here that has struggled, but yet has indulged their anxiety. Father, would they flee from that foolishness and turn to you in trust and faith? to know that you will provide. You are their father. And that truth is rock solid because you gave us your son. And so, Father, I pray for the person that has yet to put their faith in Christ, has yet to be able to receive the blessings and the cure for anxiety because they have not believed. They have not come forward to profess their faith in baptism. They have yet to enter into the life of the church where we build up one another even when we're anxious. And so, Father, I pray that as a people, we would not worry this week, but we would trust you. That we would lay our lives before you as we seek your kingdom. And we would receive the righteousness of Christ and all the other blessings that you've promised. Father, please help us. Help us trust you and to enjoy that trust each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.